Hi, my name is Matthew Reed, and welcome to the sixth in our Reed Repairs series. Today we have a late 19th, early 20th century fusee driven mantle clock with a skeletonized movement frame. The story is that uh, a mirror fell on the clock. The uh, good news is that the mirror was fine. The not quite so good news is that the clock required quite a few repairs in order to return it to working order. And this video is that story. So hope you like it. If you do, please remember to click the like and subscribe button and we will see you at the end of the video. So first out of our packing crate or case is the uh, dial or the uh, silvered brass chapter ring I suppose. Um, it seems flat enough uh, but we can see that all three uh, dial feet have sheared off leaving stubs in the, uh, in the plate. Next up is the pendulum, which is a pretty standard fare. Not quite sure what this threaded brass insert is in the back of the pendulum bob. Maybe um, it had a brass or blued steel disc to cover the opening where the lead was poured in. I don't know, maybe you've got some ideas. Very typically the slot for the crutch pin has been bent in um, to accommodate wear. And of course the suspension spring is broken off. Now, looking at the movement, um, we can see that the movement frame is bent. It's kind of bent backwards and downwards. The remains of the suspension spring are in the back cock pendulum slot, um, but it's broken, we'll need replacing. And uh, we can see that one of the pallet arbor pivots uh, has sheared off. So the pivots are one element of the bearings in a clock. Normally they rotate because of the wheels. In this case, the action is reciprocating as the pendulum swings backwards and forwards. And yes, one of the escape wheel pivots has also sheared off. And some of the teeth on the escape wheel are bent, I notice. So moving our way down the uh, movement frame, uh, we can see that the main spring barrel arbor, again the axle about which the barrel rotates, has sprung out of the frame. And um, when the uh, damage happened, the clock was obviously part wound. So there'll be stored energy in the main spring, which we'll need to deal with in a few moments. The movement frame screws have uh, in some places pulled out of their threads 
and I notice that one of the movement frame washers is missing as well. The braided uh, rope, textile rope, that once mated with the blown glass shade has frayed. Now the glass shade had disappeared uh, before the clock had its accident and it was covered by a kind of perspex box and that got broken. And in fact the base that this clock is on um, had a blown glass shade at one point but this clock couldn't fit underneath it because it sticks out too far at the front and the back. So there's obviously been some alterations over the years. So our first thing to do is to get the remaining power off that mainspring just in case it causes more trouble. Uh, there's a risk of more damage to the mechanism and a smaller risk of personal injury as well. So to that end I tied the frame with archival cotton tape and wearing safety gloves and eye protection I let the power off the mainspring using a mainspring letdown tool via the Fusey setup ratchet. So with the power safely off the mainspring, we can remove the movement from its wooden base. Uh, I note that the knurled movement retaining nuts are later and the studs onto which they fit have been damaged and cut uh, by holding with pliers or something, but I suppose they're functional. So uh, when removing the hands, these are two blued steel hands, I note that the brass boss or collet on which the hour hand is fitted is later and that in turn is a poor fit on the hour wheel pipe, meaning that the hour hand is unstable.
So there we are. The clock is in bits and we have a preliminary list of repairs. So my first actual job here is to make a jig um, that will help me when straightening out the movement frame. We know or can conjecture that originally the barrel arbor, the fusee arbor, the escape wheel arbor and the pallet arbor were planted or set on a common vertical center line through the clock frame. So this gives us our starting point and although we don't have to get the frame perfectly square it's certainly something to aim for.
With our movement frame jig completed, I decide, for some light relief, to make a replacement movement frame washer to replace the one that's missing. I use cast brass for colour matching and then tone or patinate the finished item to make it kind of match with the rest of the frame. So in terms of straightening the, uh, the frame, when brass is worked, that is, it's hammered or rolled or bent by a mirror falling on it, for instance, it becomes work hardened. Now this property has been used by clockmakers for centuries, for example, work hardening the teeth of wheels. But here we can see that the frame where bent has been stretched on one side and put in compression on the other and you can see the brass is actually kind of puckered up. So to reduce the risk of the frame cracking when I straighten it up again I decide to attempt at least to stress relieve or normalise the material in order to reduce the work hardening which should in theory make it easier to bend back. 
Now, I don't want to completely anneal the frame, soften it, as that would soften the bearings too. Well, I was not particularly happy with my stress relieving attempt. To do this better, I needed a temperature controlled kiln. It was an interesting experiment. I'm not sure that it made a whole lot of difference, um, but it was worth a try. With the, uh, the movement frame straightened, uh, at least okay for now, I tried to figure out the order of these frame pillars and although they have scratched marks they don't appear to correspond to the frame so my conclusion is I just have to put them where they seem to fit best. Uh, many earlier clocks do have makers marks that tend to be incredibly reliable though uh, regrettably not here. So I build up the frame uh, with the fusee, the centre wheel and the intermediate or third wheel just to check that everything is reasonably straight and to check depthing, that is the meshing of the gears. If the depthing needs optimising, some holes 
um, or the bearing holes may need moving to change the centre distance. And this is a process that is often called bushing. Next up is our escape wheel, where you can see the pivot or the bearing has broken off. So I drill out the axle or arbor in the watchmaker's lathe and insert a new pivot using hardened and tempered steel, which is called blued pivot steel, so essentially made for this exact job. I also straighten uh, some of the bent escape wheel teeth using a pair of smooth jawed flat nose pliers. I can do the final tweaking of these teeth when the escapement or the clock is assembled and I can observe the amount of what we call drop. Drop is free rotation of the escape wheel and differences in drop may relate to bent long or short teeth amongst other things, but for now we are good.
I carry out a similar operation, re-pivoting, on the pallet arbor. So the pallets interact with the escape wheel that we've just seen, forming the escapement, and it's the escapement in a clock or watch that you can hear ticking as it runs. Now, I note that the pallets have been permanently riveted to their collet. Originally, they would have been screwed on. Next, I turn my attention to the pendulum. I straighten and burnish the crutch pin slot to make it parallel again. And we'll make a new crutch pin to fit. This then allows me to judge the length of the new suspension spring that we need to make. As a general rule of thumb, the crutch pin would sit in the middle of the, uh, the slot in a kind of vertical sense. Before we can make the suspension spring, uh, we need to straighten out the back cock pendulum support. You can see that the slot has been squeezed together at some point and closed up to fit probably an off the peg commercial suspension spring. So we uh, make these um, sort of arms parallel again and then check that with uh, a gauge pin, or in this case, the shank of a twist drill.
with the suspension spring uh, made, uh, it's time to move on to the motion work. The motion work are the gears that sit in front of the main movement frame but behind the dial. They're the gears that uh, drive the hands. I can see this little bracket called the minute cock um, is uh, sloppy in its fitting, its taper pins. So I plug the movement frame holes and re-drill in the original site of the pins to make the minute cock a snug fit with better depthing between the minute wheel pinion, the small gear, and the hour wheel itself. So I uh, get on to bluing the hands. Now normally I would not blue hands, um, but these were particularly variegated from a previous bluing attempt, I guess. So I tidy them up a bit before riveting the hour hand onto a new collet that I turned. And now I can get the clock on its first test. When I do get the clock up and running, I notice that the mainspring, which is almost certainly a replacement, seems way too strong. Remember this mainspring here has very little work to do. It obviously needs to keep the pendulum ticking and the clock needs to carry the hands. But that's all it needs to do. So I replace it with a new, uh, weaker one, which will help preserve the clock in the longer term.
you will remember that all three dial feet had sheared off. So I carefully drill out the stubs that remain in the chapter ring and then I drill out the dial feet and insert new threaded sections. With the work on the main clock nearing completion, I gently tap down the burrs on the fusey winding square and modify a new winding key to fit. From stock, these modern winding keys are okay, but they have parallel broached square hole, which does not match with an historic winding arbor, which tends to be tapered. And also the broached hole isn't deep enough, so using um, a graver to cut out the inside of the square and a three square file, I make the key uh, a much better fit. So I decide to consolidate the frayed textile in the base by sewing together the detached ends with colour matched thread.
I do, in the end, make new knurled nuts and studs to hold the movement to its base. Now this wasn't strictly necessary, so I can't quite remember what my motivation was at the time, but I do uh, pass the um, earlier uh, replacement ones to the customer, so in theory at least it's a reasonably easy job to change them back again.
So there we are. You see our clock is now returned to working order. And I think it's interesting because there's quite a range of kind of craft skills needed uh, to repair a clock like this. From straightening the frame to repivoting those wheels, making one or two small parts and so on. So hope you like that. If you do, remember we've got another YouTube channel called How to Repair Pendulum Clocks where we go a bit more into the kind of technical side of things. So please check that out. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe and we will see you again soon with some more content. Bye for now.